Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Morning Devo with Boo. Super excited to be here on this Friday. Wow, already Friday. Super amazing day um, in the sense that we are in Genesis chapter 6. And this is a really neat passage, too. And it's neat to do a devotion out of here, too, and just get our kind of mind focused on God this morning and that's what the morning devos with Bo O is all about my name's Bo Willette and you can always check out the archives of these devos e at my YouTube channel Bo Willette and there we have gone through just about all of the New Testament other than Matthew Mark and Luke and now we're doing some devotions in the mornings nine o'clock uh, in the Old Testament so now we are in the wonderful book of Genesis. So pretty stoked about that. You can always check out the live stream as well on YouTube. I'm going to say hi right now on there. And uh, there's always a great uh, Facebook family um, that are joining in the Devo these mornings. So super stoked. Laura, Casey, it's great to see you all in the house. Tamara, well, we're going to get right into it. Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to read from the Robert Alter uh, translation 
Um, so he did a translation of the Torah, if I remember, the first five books. And it says, this is chapter six. So this is one of those Twilight zone kind of parts of the Bible. Now, we just got done this amazing genealogy of the line of Seth in the book of Genesis chapter 5. And now we get to chapter 6, and we get into the p- what's going on on the earth now. And it says, as it happened, er, and it happened, as humankind began to multiply over the earth. Now, let me just stop there and just, I got to tell you, you know, I got to realize that sometimes I don't really know the past too well. And I might think uh, uh, of the past and human beings as kind of primitive. I don't know if you were raised like that, maybe in a um, educational system that really uh, produced uh, some interesting um, uh, thoughts within its students. And one of those thoughts that it produced in me was that people of old were dumb. And I don't know if that's maybe how you were raised too, or the, again, the, the system that you were in, but that's kind of what I got, is that people, uh, the ancient world was stupid. They didn't know anything, um, you know, and, and it kind of always seemed, you know, that that's how the idea was. And, uh, you know, but I just want to help you with this a little bit, that the Bible, when I was reading the Bible, man, I realized that the Bible was saying something super different. Hey, Tina, what's happening? And, yeah, that it was totally different, that the the days of old were actually days of incredible, we already saw in Genesis, there was, there was incredible industry going on. Isn't that amazing? We already saw that through Cain's descendants became, m- there was industries of, making forging tools and cities being built and you know already people were making a name for themselves you know through this these industries right and musicians were becoming on the scene people were uh, playing music learning music being educated in music uh it, very phenomenal a lot different than what again i was taught uh growing up um so sometimes education can um you know, we think it's always great, but it can be something quite interesting. Bob Marley once said, the famous reggae superstar, he said, uh, me say the people, he's, he talked about education system, graduating <laughs> thieves and murderers. Wow, that education systems sometimes aren't graduating people, aren't teaching the right thing. He was basically getting to the point that sometimes education systems are teaching wrong things. And, um, and yeah, so I kind of had to relearn things. And, you know, uh, I think of that this morning and just, God, give me a sensitive heart to relearn things according to your word. Help me, help me to learn what you say about what, how the world looks. Let me get a world view from your word, not from what maybe man might think or what man might say to uh, knowing that man is, mankind is limited human beings are limited but knowing that you that you've given us a history and you have revealed yourself throughout it throughout what you've given us and help us to understand the world according to what you say not so much according to what I say and so it says that people began to multiply now I'm going to read something to you just so you kind of grab this. It says, according to Genesis 5, remember what we did last yesterday, lifespans of Adam and Eve averaged to 912 years. Each of the patriarchs mentioned had other sons and daughters, meaning they each had sons and daughters. Remember it said that? And it said, in addition to the sons recorded by the name, the, uh, the table calculations are based on lifespans of 900 years, first child comes at age 50 just we're just making a kind of a, a guess here childbearing years maybe 500 let's say because they lived 900 years so maybe that good 500 years of childbearing years how does that sound Woo. one child let's just say there's one child every five years during this 500 years of childbearing years well if that were the case and you were gonna um kind of record try to do a calculation of what the population was like we're already in the five billion range 
isn't that amazing? If you just took the lifespans of 900 years, you just took the first child coming at the age of 50, childbearing years of 500, and you just did one child every five years. Just one child every five years. So you get to about five billion people <laughs> on the earth. So it, did you did you ever get taught that, you know, that, you know, gosh, you know, there was Adam and Eve, and then there was like nobody forever. And, you know, it's just kind of, you know, you get that idea, you get that thought that there was just barely anybody around. No, <laughs> there's a bunch of people around. You know, again, if you take these calculations and, and you just take, again, that, that really conservative uh, table of a childbearing, uh, one child every five years in a 500-year childbearing lifespan, um, you know, or bearing years. Uh, for a, a woman, uh, you get this calculation. But what if you did, what if you said four children every five years or th just say two children every five years? Man, you'll be up in the 10 billions, you know, 20 billions, 30 billion. You know, you'd be up a lot of people, you know. There happened as humankind began to multiply over the earth and daughters were born to them. Wow many people uh, on the earth at this time. Now, we got a, a, a note, too, from the last uh, study that we did, the last little devotion, that the names all in Genesis chapter 5 really meant something. It meant a real story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There were some, some really interesting pictures of what everybody's name meant, and if you put them all together, it said something that was really cool. And maybe I'll bring that up uh, again just to show you maybe what that was like. Because that was kind of neat, I thought. So let me see if I can bring this up to you guys, let you see that. Yeah, that was that was yesterday, and you guys saw that. So that was pretty cool, right? Ooh, let me see if I can get that right. Yeah, can you guys see all that? I'm hoping you can't. There you go. You know, so anyway... I just wanted to show you that again. But let's go into this. So daughters were born. They already had the message of the gospel. It was kind of laid out there. And um, people's names meant something. Uh, Methuselah's meant judgment is going to be coming. Ooh, you know, gosh. Uh, you know, upon his death, it says judgment. Uh, that's what his name was meaning, upon his death, judgment. And so there was some insights, some little hints into Something's going to happen. But here we see daughters were born to them and that the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were comely. And now I'm not going to get into a full blown Bible study on this, but I'm going to tell you this is that I have had two wonderful, wonderful pastors, leaders, teachers, professors um, invest in me over my life and uh, super thankful for both of them. One of them is a gentleman named uh, David Guzik and another one is Scott Richards and both of these men I super value their investment in the Bible and what I find is so fascinating is both of them have different takes on this passage and, you know, I would always recommend you go to EnduringWord.com and you could check out what David Guzik says on Chapter 6. And you can also go to CalvaryChristianFellowship.com and you could check out, uh, find uh, um, Scott's Genesis 6 just in the search. You might want to put in Genesis Chapter 6, see if you can find his audio of Genesis 6 and listen to his or listen to a reason for hope and he has answered this question many times of uh, his thoughts on Genesis chapter 6 and what it's about but they're different and so there you go you can have two different teachers and professors and they can have different views uh, on it but I respect them both for our Devo purposes we, let's read this it says daughters were born to uh, people. People were multiplying. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, calmly. It's beautiful. Isn't that cool? The Bible says something is beautiful. That there is objective beauty. 
Isn't that awesome? That there is, there is something that's objectively beautiful. That the Bible says there's some, such a thing as beauty. Yeah, beauty is real. And that's, that's awesome. I, I love that idea that I can look out and see things and see people and see uh, the sky and see the trees and see that there's beauty in things. There's something that's wonderful to, to gaze at. And, you know, I want to have a right perspective of those things. I don't want to lust after the flesh. Now, let's see what these people do, but I want to be able to properly view things that are beautiful. It says they took themselves for themselves wives, and I never like that term, right? They took for themselves wives. It sounds very narcissistic, right? Take for yourself a wife, you know? Um, like, hey, there she is over there. Go get her, you know, kind of thing. And um, sounds uh, very, you know, you know, that misogynistic kind of vibe. You know, that's what I get anyway. Took for themselves, you know, wives. Lord, help me not be that way. Help me not be that narcissistic guy. Help me not be that one who looks at someone and objectifies for my own personal gain, you know, my own personal desire. Help me to fight those things. And that's a continual thing in our life is that continual fight against. That's fighting the good fight, really. Fighting against those false teachings that go into your mind all the time, the narcissistic things. Nothing's wrong with beauty. The Bible talks about beauty. You know, she was beautiful. Nothing's wrong with seeing something and going, wow, that's pretty. That's beautiful. You know, there's an attractiveness to the trees, to, you know, when I go snow skiing and see everything, it looks beautiful. There's an attractiveness to this. But help me glorify the right thing eh, when I look at beauty, you know, and not look at it in this taking for themselves they took wives however uh, they chose and the lord said my so the lord now speaks my breath shall not abide in the human forever for he is but flesh but let his days be a hundred and twenty so there's a little bit of a countdown here his days are going to be a hundred and twenty my breath shall not abide my spirit shall not abide. Same word, spirit, breath. My spirit, it could say, shall not abide in the human forever. The breath of life. He breathed into Adam and he became a living being. This breath of God, this life source that we have. Let his days be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth. And afterward as well, the sons of God having come to bed with the daughters of man who bore them children. And they are the heroes of um, old, the men of renown. Nephilim, the meaning of it in the Hebrew term is fallen ones. That's right. The fallen ones. That's what the term Nephilim means. Fallen ones. So the fallen ones were on the earth. Afterward as well, meaning after we're going to see what happens. And really what's talking about is the flood. The flood's going to happen. Noah's flood. And it says, the sons of God having come to bed with the daughters of humans, man, mankind, right? And it says, who bore them children. And I'm not going to get into all of what that could be or but it, it just lets us know that these fallen ones were on the earth before and after the flood. And they had uh, intimacy with women. And their offspring were called the heroes of old. People, men of renown. So that's what it says. So without all the things we can get into and the speculative things, that's just what it says. There was things happening. People were engaged. It was not only uh, population growth, you know, but people were, the way their, maybe their sexual relationships were, it doesn't sound like it was too healthy. It doesn't sound like there was a lot of love, you know. And uh, so it goes on. Now God says, hey, my breath's not going to be with humans 
uh, he says, but let his days be 120. And the Lord saw that the evil of the human creature was great on the earth and that every scheme of his heart devising was only perpetual evil. E everything was evil. In who? In the human creatures. In human beings. Oh man, are we so prone to fall? Are we so prone to move away? Evil. Are we so prone to be bent? That's what I, I like when I, when I see hear the word evil, I think of bending, bent. The Lord saw the bending of hu the human creature, that he was great on the earth. It was great on the earth. Uh, uh, and that every scheme, every scheme, the schematic, right, the layout of his heart was always bent, devising only what was perpetually evil. And we can take any subject as human beings, man, and we can bend it extremely. There's so many things I could talk about about this chapter, but it's, it's, it's pretty hardcore of how humans have distorted so many areas of life. And we've tweaked them utterly. And, you know, when you think depravity can't get worse in us, we do it. We, we invent it. You know, we'll, we'll make it up. Oh, God. You know, the psalmist said, no one living before you is righteous. Boy, do we need saving. If there's anything these chapters tell us right here is that, man, we need help. You know, when, when I read this as a 17-year-old, it was, wow, man, we need some help. And when it said every thought is evil, I went, amen. That's true. <laughs> Everything is a little tweaked in me, you know. And... um and I think you might even admit some of that yourself, that, man, you know what? Things are kind of tweaked in me. And, you know, before you can get help, you need to admit that something's wrong. And here there's a clear indica in indication from the scripture that something's wrong. Even the godly line of Seth from chapter 5, it looks like is, is bending, right? Because it said the Lord saw that the evil of the humans was great on the earth and that every scheme of their heart was going astray. So even that wonderful godly line of Seth that seemed to be walking with God, man, it seems like everything started to get tweaked. You know, so, hey, Paula, hope you're doing great. It says, and the Lord regretted having made the human on the earth and was grieved in the heart. God is a personal God. You see the personhood of the Lord. And this is the unique thing about God. God can be the ruler, the judge, right? The one who doesn't submit to nobody. And then you see that Jesus, the Son of God, is one who submits and who is meek and who um, walks in these humble ways and is sad and burdened these kind of things you see the uniqueness of God God can have all these different characteristics and I will wipe out the human race I created from the face of the earth from human to cattle to crawling thing to the fowl of the heavens for I regret that I have made them but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord so the only way human beings can continue is through grace that's it and that's that's just like with me today. The only way I could really glorify God today is going to be by grace. It's not going to be by my effort. It's going to have to be a work of grace. And I hope I could submit. I want to submit. Lord, help me to submit my heart, my mind, uh, my body to you. Help me surrender. Uh, you know, help me to go through the death I need to go through so that I can experience a life that's more glorifying to you and then my instead of my own wants my own things right grabbing people for myself right that kind of idea are you using people in your life for yourself is that why you have them in your life are they are they just usury um, or are you wanting to glorify God in those relationships it's a good thought you know something to think about so Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the lineage of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, and he was blameless in his time. And what kind of time was this? A time where 
the, uh, there was evil in all the human creatures. Now, Jesus said something in the book of Luke that's pretty interesting, and I'll read it to you just so it kind of gives us a little more context into maybe our day today. But Jesus talking about the last days, something in the future from where we're at today, says, and it was, uh, or as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And it says, until uh, the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was in the day of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And But on the day the, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them. And so it will be, de- be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. So all these things are going on in Genesis chapter 6. There's evil in the hearts of people. There's distortions. There's massive m- uh, population massive intimacy going on uh maybe even some strange intimacy uh something that seems very abnormal or not what god intended let's say it that way not what god intended and um and we see a lot of uh um you know selfishness going on and here we see that god's heart in a sense breaks over the result of sin Jesus before Lazarus in the book of John chapter 11 his buddy Lazarus dies and the shortest chapter in our shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept Jesus saw the death uh, what death brings the destruction and 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 wept so it says Noah begot three sons Shem Ham Japheth and the earth was corrupt before God. So here we keep saying this. The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with outrage. This whole idea of corruption, evil, outrage. And God saw we are in rebellion against God. This is a theme throughout the Bible that now that we are separated from the deity um, and we are, we are in a sense have gone drastically the other way, that our hearts are prone to not seek God but to seek our own. And God saw that the earth and, and, and it was corrupt. We have a knowledge of good of good and evil now. And we um, are bent towards the evil. Though we know the good to do, we are bent towards the evil. Um, we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God saw the earth and, and look, it was all corrupt. For all the flesh had corrupted its ways. So a lot of corruption, corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. Things are corrupt. Things are tweaked. Things are corrupt. And uh, it says, um, and um, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with outrage by them. And, And I wonder if that outrage is even a vehement hatred of God, knowing good and evil. Maybe there's a incredible hatred of what happened um, uh, in the garden. I don't know, but maybe there's an incredible um, resentment towards God that's going on. You know, do people have an anger towards God today? Do people get mad at God? Do people feel that God is not just or God is not righteous? Or, you know, if there really is a God, he would do it this way. Do people talk that way today? Yeah, absolutely. If there really is a God, he would do this. Or if he was really a God, why would he allow that? You know, still people have this outrage in them, right? This full-blown outrage. So I don't think I don't think we're much different today, if at all. And it says, and I am now about to destroy them with the earth. Now, I, when I read this, I think of it this way too. You know, you know, as God's creation, you know, God certainly has the right to do what God needs to do. God will uphold his righteousness. And he can uphold that righteousness just as a judge upholds the righteousness of a law in the courtroom. And am I okay with that today? Am I okay with God ruling the way God needs to rule? Or am I going to fight God on how he's ruling the world? Is that going to be my day where I'm going to brawl God? Why does God do this? Why does God do that? Why is he doing this? Is that what I'm going to be doing today? Or am I going to trust 
that God is going to do things to uphold his name and his righteousness and his justice. And he's going to do it to uphold his grace also and his mercy and his love. He's going to take all of these things in. Um, <laughs> he takes everything uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in making the decisions that he's making. You know, he takes all those things in effect uh, and he's all upholding his holiness, his righteousness. And so I'm going to trust that. I need to trust that or else I'm going to get squirrely. And I'm going to be a person that has a lot of rage. And I will have outrage as well. You know, just as, you know, when we see uh, a court who, who, who you know, uh, a judge that lets someone go that should be guilty, we have an outrage towards them. But I, I pray, God, help me not be outraged against you for what you're doing. You know, you, you in your righteousness can do whatever you want. And if you need to judge us, we certainly deserve it because we've broken the law. We haven't trusted you. We've taken of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. Our eyes are opened. We see the evil that we do. We know the good to do, but we, we see the evil as well. And we've chosen the evil. Um, we go that route. It says, make yourself an ark, right? A place of protection, a safety the ark who do you go to for protection who is the place you go to who is the one you run to for safety when the floods come make yourself an ark of cypress wood with cells so you can make uh, the ark and and caulk it inside and out with pitch this is how you shall make it 300 cubits the ark's length 50 cubits it's width I always think of um, the old um, oh gosh the comedian um, Noah uh, oh, man, P Bill Cosby, that's who it was, who did that Noah's Flood routine. It says, um, make a skylight in the ark within a cubit of the top, you shall finish it, and put an entrance in the ark on one side. One way to get in, right? One way. Uh, with lower and middle and upper decks, you shall make it. As for me, I am going to bring the flood water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, uh, that has within it the breath of life from under the heavens. Everything on the earth shall perish. Everything that has life will now experience its darkness. It's the result of its evil. It'll, it'll get the consequences of that. And I will set up my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark. Your sons, your wife, and your wives, uh, the wives of your sons with you. And from all that lives, from all flesh, two of each thing you shall bring to the ark to keep alive with you. Male and female, they shall be. So God continues to um, cultivate the male-female relationship throughout the flood. From the fowl of each kind, um, uh, all that crawls on the earth, um, uh, two of each shall come to you and be kept alive. And you shall take uh, from every food that is eaten and store it by you. And that's how it goes. And so Noah did all that he commi uh, God commanded, and so it was. And so Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the ark can be a real picture of Jesus for us, right? There's one way to enter, one way to go in. Um, and he is our, if our, if you will, our safety. He is our construction. He's the building that we go into and we find safety in. And we, so we see a little bit of that picture of Christ in the, the refuge um, of the ark for Noah. And Noah is that picture of one who is the remnant, the one who find the, the, the group of people that find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and boy, you know, I want to be that person who finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, aren't you just thankful today that your eyes maybe are opened to Jesus? Do you find yourself just thankful for that? That, man, I know, I know the ark. I know what it's there for. Uh, there's one door and I can enter into and I'm going to go into that. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, today, are we okay with the way God judges, the way God's rulership of the world is? Do we see the depravity of human beings? 
um, for what it really is, that it really is depraved, that humans are bent, that we are a mess, that humans, no matter how much we try to do the right, we always go wrong directions. Uh, do we see that there is a need for judgment in humanity, a humbling that's needed um, in us as humans, um, and that God is righteous to judge us um, according to his laws? And so, but he makes a way out. He makes a way out. And that's what we get from ja chapter 6. Though there's so much chaos going on and corruption and outrage, um, and think of how many people. Oh my gosh. You think it's, you think it's uh, populated today. <laughs> you, know, you think we're populated today. What if the world was double, triple that back then? And, and people are in utter chaos and rebellion against God doing what they want to do um, yeah it's su super sad but this is the the one of the things that we have to just settle our hearts on uh, to be able to walk at peace today is just to know that um, I am a person in need and that my need is a spiritual one I need to be made right spiritually and all the physical things of this earth are not going to help me in my mind and in my heart. They'll satisfy. There'll be things for the taking. There'll be things for my flesh to desire. But they won't satisfy the heart. And they won't help me to love other people. They'll continue to help me to lust other people and demand. But they won't help me to love. And so I need, I need, I need an ark. I need a place where I can go. I need a refuge place I can run to and find the help that I need find the safety that I need and that's what the ark is too it's great safety for Noah Jesus is great safety for us he says come to me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon me he says come to me he says for my burden is 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 easy it's it's light you know so come to me you who are burdened by something go to the ark right go to the ark you who have found grace you whose eyes are opened go to the ark very cool so hey paul i'm glad you liked the names of the biblical names yeah that's that was definitely neat right a real cool picture of the gospel so anyway that's genesis chapter six and very cool a lot of a lot of bible studies based off that chapter for sure but i hope we got some good gems out of there in the Devo this morning. So you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for joining. Tamara says, oh yes, I would gladly enter the, uh, enter the flood for this corrupt time to be cleansed away. Yeah, um, that's right. And uh, yeah, we look at the world and we see how crazy it is. And, um, and I'm, I, I would imagine back then it was even worse. So um, you guys have a great one, okay? So good being with you this morning. Take care. Stay in the word. Bye-bye.